Hello, today we're talking about Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. This is the one and only movie directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Cuaron? I don't know how to say his last name. This is the same guy that directed Children of Men, a movie that I liked a lot. He also made Gravity, and I think he did a pretty decent job with this movie. The tonal change from one movie to another is the most drastic between the Chamber of Secrets and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Things are getting serious in the wizarding world now. I know that they were kind of serious before, but throughout both of Christopher Columbus's movies, there was this ongoing, like, goofy fun to them. There's a little bit of that in this movie, but you can tell that Alfonso is taking the series in a more adult direction. The movie starts with Harry turning that Bruh. Aunt Marge into a balloon, and it's amazing. I love this scene. Bruh. Throughout all the movies, this was my favorite introduction to a Harry Potter movie. It's just such a brilliantly done scene. I'm pretty sure they actually blew her up into a balloon, and it's amazing. Overall, the scene is so well done, from the cinematography, the music, and it's incredibly entertaining. The color palette in this movie definitely looks more dead. It's more mute. It's not as colorful and vibrant like it was in the previous two. And then we get the magic school bus scene. Harry runs from home. I'm surprised he didn't do so sooner. But yeah, he's sitting on the side of the road and then the magic school bus comes out of nowhere. It definitely gives me Totoro cat bus vibes. I guess it's called the magic night bus. This part is also hilarious. Take it away, Ernie, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> then the jazz kicks in and the bus speeds down the road. It's such a great scene. It honestly should have been a ride at Universal Studios. And then it stops for the granny that's crossing the street only to blast off again. It's just perfect for a ride, if you think about it. And then it squeezes between two other double-decker buses, and their faces get all distorted. So then Harry has a meeting with Cornelius Fudge and his little hunchback friend, Igor. I'm not sure if his name is actually Igor, but he looks like an Igor, so... And both of these people desperately want Harry Potter to eat food. I mean, maybe he could gain some weight, but damn. They're trying to force feed him in this scene. It's weird. And it's something that I definitely didn't remember until I watched it again. <laughs> Then we get the monster book of monsters in this movie. It attacks Harry in one scene. It does something else in another scene later on. And of course they turn it into merch just like they turned everything from this franchise into merch. The Dementor introduction was very well done. It starts with the windows freezing over. A Dementor starts creeping around the train. While we were watching this, my wife Sarah told me that this part in the video game, she just couldn't get past when she was younger. I personally never played the game for this. I just thought that was funny. We get a choir scene of a bunch of kids singing Double Double Toil and Trouble. And there's this one Hufflepuff girl that has the wildest facial expressions while she's singing. <laughs> Like, you know that when she was told she was going to be in a Harry Potter movie, she freaked out and wanted to give it her all during this part, because who knows if she would be in any other parts. And it is hilarious. <laughs> I've never seen someone accentuate their face so much while singing. <laughs> double, double, toy and trouble. Oh, just doing that hurt my face. This is the first movie with Michael Gambon as the new Dumbledore. And I think out of everybody that they could have found, Michael Gambon is perfect for the role. They honestly did a perfect job recasting Dumbledore. It's not very often when you get two people that played the same character in the same series and you like them both almost equally. He doesn't have as much of that stereotypical endearing old man wizardy vibe to him like Richard Harris had, but what he brings to the table is a more lively version of Dumbledore and I think Michael Gammon took up the mantle perfectly. This is also the movie where we meet Buckbeak the Hippogriff, and Hagrid is being just as irresponsible as ever. <laughs> Basically, he's in charge of the magical creatures, and uh, some of them are a bit unpredictable. <laughs> this is a potentially very dangerous creature, and he's having these kids approach it one by one, and at the first sign of this Hippogriff not showing aggression towards Harry, he hoists Harry up in the air and throws him on top of it. <laughs> forcing him to fly on it. Oh my God. If I were Harry Potter, I don't know. I would not be a big fan of Hagrid. <laughs> all the shit he puts me through is just like, I would avoid him at all costs. Hagrid smacks the thing's ass and has it fly away without giving Harry any instruction on how to fly it or what to do when he's in the air. <laughs> like, it's insane. What the fuck is wrong with Hagrid? I like it, Kudgy. 
And then Draco gets scratched by it and he starts acting like he's on his deathbed. Draco is a huge pussy throughout these movies. It's pretty hilarious. This is the part where I would have put Tom Felton roasting me and my channel if he accepted the cameo that I ordered. This is where I put a cameo. If I had one. But he canceled them, so. I tried, guys. We then get the hilarious Boggart scene. Basically, it's like the shape-shifting creature that Lupin keeps locked in a closet, which is pretty awful. <laughs> He's not treating it very well, and he only lets it out so people can use spells on it. This poor Boggart. <laughs> it is a pretty funny scene, though. This is the part where we get to see Snape wearing a grandma's clothing. So yeah, the idea is that you're supposed to use a spell called Ridiculous, and it changes the Boggart from something scary into something funny. This one girl uses the spell on it, and it turns from a snake into this insanely creepy clown thing. Like, what? How is that funny to anybody? That is the scariest looking clown I've ever seen in my life. God, this girl has a very strange sense of humor. <laughs> then we get some really cool scenes in Hogsmeade. The creativity does not stop in this movie. It's really fun seeing how they can create this wizarding world and make it a reality. And for the most part, without special effects. I gotta say, Daniel Radcliffe did not do his best work in this movie. I found some of the scenes where he's upset, kind of cringy. I hope he finds me. Because when he does, I'm going to be ready. When he does, I'm going to kill him. Ooh, you're hard. So yeah, throughout this movie, everybody thinks Sirius Black is this really awful guy. And then Harry Potter overhears a conversation about how his parents used to be friends with Sirius. And then we get this really awful explosion from Harry. <laughs> it goes like this. He was their friend! He was their friend! Oh my god. And then he does this like rapid jaw wiggle thing whenever he's upset. He does this. For some reason, he like... <sighs> This is also the movie where we get the Marauder's Map, which is a very cool plot device. It's this magical map. It basically shows the whereabouts of anybody throughout Hogwarts. I'm sure the map kind of breaks the stories in some way. Like, oh, this character should have used it during this part, or this character should have used it during this part to find this person. You know, it's just one of those things. Like, when you introduce something like this, it opens up a million questions. Like, for example, you would assume that Dumbledore would have access to magic to make something like this, and he would have given something like this to, I don't know, Filch? The groundskeeper? who makes sure the kids aren't out of bed at night, it would make his job a lot easier. <laughs> so he doesn't have to walk around the halls constantly. <laughs> As if Draco wasn't being dealt a pretty awful hand in this movie already, Hermione punches him directly in the face. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, Malfoy's a douche, but... <laughs> He keeps getting his ass kicked, so, I mean, just whatever. As far as really broken plot devices are concerned, this movie also introduces the Time Turner. I could go on forever about how this device breaks every single movie, you know? I'm sure you've heard these complaints before. <laughs> Basically, if anything goes wrong, well, why didn't Dumbledore just turn back time and set it right? It's just one of those plot devices that breaks literally everything. When you start introducing time manipulation devices, it gets really messy. And I don't think that was very smart on JK's part. Especially since the big twist involving the time turner in this movie, it wasn't even that cool. You know, it was like, oh, Hermione got to classes easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they saved themselves with the time turner and they were able to save Buckbeak and Harry using the time turner because they could be two places at once. I can think of many instances throughout these movies where being two places at once would have been very handy. No! 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 Whatever. I'm just gonna stop it there because I could honestly just make an hour-long video ranting about how broken the time turner is. And I'm sure somebody out there, maybe even JK, has written something about how the time turner isn't actually as powerful as people think it is. And maybe you're not supposed to use it. Uh, like, what? The time turner introduces closed loops. It operates on the premise that the universe will always try and revert to the way it was before. Basically, by returning to the spot where Hermione used the time turner initially, this had closed the loop to everybody else, so nothing had changed. The basic idea is that you don't accidentally bump into your past self and kill them, change their actions, or shift their perception of events. This is where we hit a paradox and things kind of get messy. There's this pretty funny thing I read online about the time turner and it goes as follows. Let's pretend Dumbledore gives Hermione the time turner at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. She walks from the room, hides in a closet, and turns back the time turner one. Hermione intercepts her past self and renders her petrified. Now, Hermione never receives the time turner. 
but she can't have not received the time turner because she used the time turn to stop herself from receiving the time turner. <laughs> So we can assume that that would just make you go insane. Something that kind of saves it is that the largest amount of time that a wizard can travel back is five hours without causing harm. What causing harm means? No idea. Romamu, I've come to bargain. It's pretty insane that McGonagall gave a time turner to Hermione just so she could attend more classes, which is the most irresponsible thing you can possibly do. Why are these teachers so insane? They gave these incredibly powerful tools to kids. What? So apparently this is what I read online. The time turner works on Novikov's self-consistency principle. The principle suggests that one timeline exists and that a time traveler cannot change the past, but can affect events in a way that creates no inconsistency. If Harry and Hermione weren't able to get back to the same spot at the exact time Hermione received the time turner, then it would have broken so much stuff. And they don't even reach the same spot. Ron watches as they pretty much teleport from one spot to another because their past selves is trying to catch up to their future selves. <laughs> and Ron just accepts this as a weird thing that happens. He's like, whoa, that's... What? <laughs> you guys were here, now you're there. Okay, uh, and they don't explain it to Ron. You'd assume they would tell Ron that they'd use the time turner just so he doesn't lose his mind. It could have gone wrong in so many ways that McGonagall giving the time turner to Hermione is just the most irresponsible thing imaginable. I mean, unless there was some way that she knew that they needed it to save Harry and to save Buckbeak. But there's no way she could have known that. But this is Novikov's principle. So McGonagall was always going to give them the time turner and they were always going to go back in time and they were always going to save Harry. It's just so strange to me that McGonagall would do that. And the way the time turner is used throughout the movie is kind of wonky. Harry and Hermione just get hit by rocks randomly in one scene. And you're like, oh. Well, that's weird. And they just forget about it and continue on with the story. <laughs> so Professor McGonagall gave Hermione the time turner, a 13 year old, so she could attend more classes. That is insane. Okay, the time turner class is over. Uh, students dismissed. The Whomping Willow scene is just ridiculous. <laughs> so Ron gets carried by Animorph Dog Sirius under the tree. His cries are hilarious. He's just like screaming. <laughs> Well, this dog's carrying him away. Ah! Oh! Hermione is lifted by the Whomping Willow. <laughs> She's being swung about. She grabs Harry by his t-shirt and somehow lifts him into the air this way. And they both start flying around. <laughs> Eventually, they all end up below the Whomping Willow. Then we get one of the best scenes in the movie. This is when Lupin and Sirius Black confront Harry, Hermione, and Ron. Sirius Black and Lupin hate Peter Pettigrew, and they know he's in the room. And they're talking about how much they want to kill him, basically. But Harry thinks that they're talking about him. It's a brilliantly done scene. Although realistically, they probably would have explained everything to Harry and the kids immediately instead of stringing them along this entire time, confusing the hell out of them. I understand. Let's kill him. No! I trusted you! Because obviously they don't know Peter Pettigrew is the rat. And Snape comes out of nowhere and they fuck him up. Later, Lupin turns into a werewolf. And for someone who knows pretty much everything about everything, Hermione is so dumb in this scene. She tries to talk to Lupin after he's already turned into a werewolf. Shouldn't she know that he's not the same person anymore? What? This is even funnier because when Snape is teaching a lesson on werewolves, her hand is constantly in the air. And he makes fun of her because she's a know-it-all. Oh my god. When future Harry saves past Harry from the Dementors, you don't hear anything. A big beam of light comes out of nowhere and saves him. But then we see this same scene from future Harry's perspective, and Harry screams the spell. He like belts it out. Expecto Patronum! I know you're across a lake right now, but you would be able to hear that. I know they didn't include it originally because they wanted the reveal to be you know, more intense. And he couldn't have just done the spell without screaming it out because it would just make the scene stupid if he didn't say anything. So I understand why they did that way. It's just kind of silly. There's a couple second scenes in this movie that must have taken forever. Like when Lupin is packing up his stuff at the end of the movie and we get the scene of his luggage packing itself. 
It's so intricately done. That's what I love most about these movies. There truly is magic in the filmmaking here. The movie ends with a goofy Daniel Radcliffe flying on a broom. Overall, I like this movie a lot. I like the change in tone. I like how they tackle things like awful journalism and how that can drastically affect the public's perception of somebody. I like how they went further into family's roots. And it's really fun in this movie to learn about the wizards that were there before Harry and Hermione and Ron. And this movie is full of iconic moments. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you're interested, the links to all of the Harry Potter videos will be in the description, as well as the video that I made on the Fantastic Beasts movies, which thankfully remained monetized. I don't always lose. <laughs> If you like Harry Potter, you know, fantasy and sci-fi, things like that, then there's a good chance you'll like my clothing line, Alien Clothing, A-Y-Y-L-I-E-N clothing.com. We sell a bunch of really cool designs over there that I think you might like. So check those out if you haven't. That's A-Y-Y-L-I-E-N clothing.com. Thank you so much to all my patrons that make videos like this possible, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.